This is Nightline, your tie line to the world, and this is Walter O'Keefe. Tonight, a visit to worlds strangely different from ours, the world of the future, the world of X minus one. Now, here is the future, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, The Coffin Cure by Alan Norse. But first, hear this. The scene of America's first Thanksgiving celebration. The top Big Ten football game of the day. One of the most unusual excursions on which a radio audience has ever been taken. These are just a few highlights of the weekend monitor as planned for you. To help set the mood for the coming Thanksgiving holiday, monitor takes you on a visit to the banks of the James River at Berkeley Plantation, Virginia. The scene of America's first Thanksgiving celebration more than 300 years ago. For sports fans, Monitor takes you to Michigan Stadium at Ann Arbor for the big Michigan-Ohio State football game. And for everybody, a most unusual listening experience as Monitor takes you behind the walls of Leavenworth Penitentiary. You'll learn of this famous prison's operation from Warden C.H. Looney. Sit down to lunch with its inmates. Learn from them how confinement behind prison walls affects a man. Learn of their opportunities for rehabilitation. There'll be celebrities, music, news, and sports. All on Monitor all weekend long, beginning Friday night over most of these NBC stations. Now, X-1 and tonight's story, The Coffin Cure. I saw the headlines on the way downtown in the morning. Common cold cured. And sure enough, there was his picture, Chauncey Patrick Coffin. The newspaper ran on deliriously. Coffin nails lid on common cold. No more coffin, states co-finder of cure. Sniffles sniped. Single shot to save sneezers. There was no doubt of it. I've always said that the man who finds the cure of the common cold would be the greatest hero in medical history. And if I could have gotten my hands on Dr. Chauncey Patrick Coffin at that moment, I would have torn him limb from limb. Almost did about a half an hour later at the laboratory. Philip, Philip, there's no sense in getting excited. It's idiocy, blind, screaming idiocy. Coffin, you're out of your mind. Can't you see what you've done? It was my idea in the first place, and Jake and I have been pounding our heads on the wall for eight solid months, and you go sneak into publication a full year before we have any business. Now, now, Philip, you... Now, how about that, Jake? Did you see the morning papers? This thief not only steals our work, he splashes it all over the countryside in red ink. Now, C.P., you shouldn't have done that. Uh, After all, we've hardly had an acceptable period of clinical trial. Oh, nonsense. Philip, you had the worst cold of your life when you took the vaccine. Have you had any since? No, of course not. Now, Jacob, how about you? Any sniffles? How about those 600 students from the university? Did I misread the reports on them? No, 98% cured of active symptoms within 24 hours. Well, of course, it's only been a month. Now, gentlemen, be reasonable. Think positively. There's work to be done, a great deal of work. 
Press conference in 20 minutes. Drug houses to consult with. Gentlemen, we won the greatest medical triumph of all time. The conquering of the common cold. We'll go down in history. He was right on that point. At least we did go down in history. Of course, it was the biggest story of the year. In medical circles, it was called the Coffin Multicentric Upper Respiratory Virus Inhibiting Vaccine. Newspapers just called it the Coffin Cure. The men from the government bureaus came first, and then 17 pharmaceutical houses descended with production plans, cost estimates, colorful graphs. One laboratory promised a vaccine in 10 days, another guaranteed it in a week. The first actually appeared in three weeks and two days to be soaked up in two hours by a thirsty sponge of cold, weary humanity. Express planes were dispatched to Europe, Asia, Africa with a precious cargo. A million needles pierced a million hides. And with a huge convulsive sneeze, mankind stepped forth into a new era. There were abstainers, of course, there always are. One of them, for example, my wife, Ellie. Now, Phil, you can talk all you want to. I don't want any cold shots. You've had this cold for two solid months now. There just isn't any sense to it. I don't want any cold shots. But why not? Just one little needle. You hardly feel it. You know I don't like needles. Oh, Ellie. (laughs) Why don't you leave me alone? Go take your nasty old needles and stick them in people that want them. I woke up once that night and listened to a parade of sneezes from Ellie. I rolled over and frowned to myself. It was ignominious in a way. The wife of one of the cold cure discoverers was refusing the fruit of all those months of work. When I woke up in the morning, I thought I was suffocating. (coughs) Hey, hey, Ellie. Ellie. Ellie, I'm choking. Ellie, what did you do? Hey, hey, what's burning? Hey, Ellie, somebody's burning down the house. Oh, what are you talking uh, about? It's just the uh, toast. I burned it. Well, it's, it's awful. What's happened here? I bake it breakfast. But uh, don't you smell it? Of course not. It's just bacon that eggs and toast. Oh. You mean you don't smell anything strange? I don't smell anything, period, with this cold. But, uh, say, did you put on fresh perfume this morning? Before breakfast? Don't be ridiculous. Not even a drop? Not one drop. This must all be in my mind, or I'm imagining things, that's all. I'm working too hard. Say, wait a minute. Ellie? Give me my hat. I've got to get down to the laboratory quick. You're listening to The Coffin Cure. Tonight's attraction on X-1. Eleven million victims, adults and children alike, beg you to break the grip of the crippler, arthritis. Advances in medical science have made possible the cure of many diseases. But further research is necessary to break this grip, to find the cause and the cure for man's oldest, most crippling disease. Let's give arthritics a chance. Help relieve their suffering now and help find the cure that will end this terrible disease for all time. Your contributions will support a double-barreled attack on arthritis, a fight in which more research and better treatment are brought to bear on one of the great menaces to our nation's health. Please join the campaign to destroy arthritis, to break the grip of the crippler. You can do your part. Please give to your local arthritis fund. Now, back to X-1 and the 
Coffin Cure. It grew worse all the way downtown. I fought down nausea as the smell of damp, rotting earth rose from my front yard. The neighbor's dog dashed out to meet me, exuding the great-grandfather of all dog odors. The crowded bus was a nightmare. I could tell that the bus driver had salami for supper the night before. My stomach began to roll, and I barely made it off the bus. I met Jake Miles at the laboratory. Hey, Coffin, come in yet? Oh, he's in there. He's got the door locked. Uh, you got it, too? Yeah. Coffin! Now, don't come too close. You got it, too? When did it start for you? Right after supper last night. I thought I was going to suffocate. I got up and walked the streets all night. What a stink. I got it sometime this morning. But I don't understand. Nobody else seemed to notice anything. You forget something. We were the first three to take the coffin cure, remember? You and me and Jake two months ago. But what's happened? Those foul smells everywhere. Every odor in this town has suddenly turned foul. Magnified, you mean? I don't think the smells have changed any. Well, but what is it then? Our noses have changed, obviously. Look at our experimental dogs. They never had colds, and they practically live by their noses. Other animals all depended on their sense of smell for survival. They don't get colds either. The multicentric virus hits primates only and it reaches the fullest power in man alone. But I, I don't get it. Why should it smell this way? I, I haven't had a cold in, in ages. Of course not. That's just the point. Look, why do we have any sense of smell at all? Because we have tiny nerve endings in the mucous membranes of our noses and throats. But we've always had the virus living there. Cold or no cold, it's always been there, except now, after the coffin cure. We got rid of the virus, remember? And now, for the first time, those nerve endings in our noses are just beginning to function. You mean you think it'll get worse? And worse, and still worse. Now, we're all in this together, Phil. It was your idea in the first place. Uh. You said so yourself. You can't leave me now. You can't. You can. You better answer your phone. Uh. Hello. Uh, I, I'm busy, and I, I can't see anyone, and I can't... What? Oh. What is it? There's a line of students outside the building. They're waiting to see me. Oh, Jake, Phil, they'll hang me. You've got to help me. Send down to the freezer and get all the live cold virus we can find. Get us some inoculated monkeys and a few dozen dogs. But you've got to help me. You've got to help me. And stop sniveling. You're the big publicity man around here. You're going to handle the screaming masses, whether you like it or not. We've got to find out how to catch the common cold again before you have to die trying. <laughs> It was a futile struggle. We sprayed our throats with enough pure culture of virulent live cold virus to have condemned an ordinary man to a cold for life. We didn't develop a sniffle. We injected the virus hypodermically, intradermally, intramuscularly, intravenously. We drank it. We bathed in it, but we didn't catch a cold. We wore wet clothes and sopping shoes to work, but we never felt better in our lives. I think you should all be locked up, taking a cold shower and then going out in the snow. You don't understand, Ellie. We've got to catch a cold. Why? Suppose you don't. What's going to happen? We had 300 students march on the laboratory today. The smells were driving them crazy. They couldn't even bear to be close to their best friends. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, we'll have them back and 300 more. And what's going to happen when 15 million people find their noses suddenly turning on them? Ellie, we just did too good a job. We just can't catch cold. We just can't crack it. Those antibodies are just doing too good a job. Well, maybe you can find uncle bodies to take care of them. Oh, now, look, don't make bad jokes. I'm not making jokes. I don't care what you do. All I want is a husband back who doesn't complain how everything smells and who doesn't stand around in cold showers at 6 o'clock in the morning. In 
the morning, Jake, Coffin, and I had a conference in the lab. Go out there anymore. I can't see those students. I've begged for time. I've promised them everything but my upper plates. I, I can't face them again. I just can't. We only have a few days left. There were 15 million antivirus shots given in the past three months, at least. Say, we don't come up with something, we're gone. You know what I think? I think we've been prize idiots. We've gotten so rattled, we haven't used our heads. And all the time, it's been sitting there, blinking at us. What are you talking about? Ellie said it this morning. Uncle bodies. Oh, he's cracked. He snapped. No, no, I'm dead serious. How many of those students do you think you can corral to help us? Six hundred. Mm. They're out there in the street right now, a blood-seeking mob howling for a lynching. All right, I want them in here, and I want some monkeys. Monkeys with colds. The worse ones, the better. Say, do you have any idea what you're doing? Not in the least, except that it's never been done before. But maybe it's time we tried following our noses for a while. Tidal wave began to break two days later. Only a few people here, a dozen there, but we could tell it was coming. At the laboratory, the doors were kept barred, telephones disconnected. Jake rigged up some small gas masks, but it didn't do much good. But the work went on in spite of the smells, and you have no idea what a truckload of monkeys smells like magnified 10,000 times. We had cold-ridden monkeys, sneezing, coughing, weeping, wheezing monkeys by the dozen. Culture trays bulged with tubes. Each day, 600 angry students holding their noses paraded through the lab, arms exposed. At the end of the week, half the monkeys were cured of their colds and couldn't get them back. And the other half had new colds and couldn't get rid of them. That meant we were on the right track. And then, two days later, Jake came into the laboratory triumphantly. Jake, what's the idea of bringing that dog in here? I've got six nose plugs and they still don't do any good. But look at that puppy. Look at it. Watch him carefully. You hear? He sneezed. He's got a cold. That's the first dog in history that ever got a cold. And we've won. <laughs> I was the first volunteer. We injected the new serum in my arm and sat back and waited. We were still waiting three days later. Well, it was a great idea. Just didn't work, that's all. Where's Coffin? He collapsed three days ago. He kept having anxiety dreams about hanging. Well, I suppose we'd better just face it. Nice knowing you, Jake. Pity it had to end this way. Well, it was a great try, old man, a great try. Ah, yes, we will be remembered by an infuriated world holding its nose in vain. Nothing like going down in a blaze of... Up. Up? What's the matter? In a blaze of... Ah, ah, ah. Phil, say it again. Huh? Choo! Oh, what a moment. Phil, we've won. <gasps> Now, just keep your feet in this warm bath, Phil, and drink plenty of hot lemon juice. You'll be all right. You see, it was your idea, the uncle bodies. Hmm? We developed an antibody against the cold virus, and then we had to develop an antibody against the antibody. Will they be able to make it fast enough? Just about fast enough for the people to get good and eager to catch cold again. Mm. There's only one little hitch. Hitch? The stuff we bathe does a real good job, just a little too good. I may be wrong, but I think I've got this cold for keeps. Unless I can find an antibody against the antibody against the antibody. <laughs> Fred Collins again, and I'll have another word about X-1 in a moment. (laughs) 
Is your head buzzing with a feverish, stuffed-up feeling of a cold? Here's how to get relief. Every second someone takes it for the miseries of a cold. Bromo Quinine brand cold tablets. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Galley Slave by Isaac Asimov. The three laws of positronic robots made it impossible to kill a human. But there was a loophole. Murdering a man after his death. Read it in Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. X-1 has brought you The Coffin Cure, a story written by Alan Norse and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in our cast were Raymond Edward Johnson as Phil, Joseph Bell as Coffin, Harvey Hayes as Jacob, and Betty Kane as Ellie. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Hear Nightline with Walter O'Keefe, next on most of these NBC stations. Mm -hmm. 